Thank you, Chair. My fellow panelists here in the dais and ladies and gentlemen. In the previous session, uh, some panelists very rightly pointed out that instead of defense production, it should have been defense industry. I think one of the representatives of the organizers here today, I personally think that is a very wonderful suggestion and we should have uh, uh, taken that uh, into account. Uh, in a way, this is something also was highlighted by, is it of the right height? Yeah. It was uh, highlighted by none other than our uh, late President uh, Abdul Kalam. And let me quote him here. He had said, the need of the hour is to establish a military industry complex at the national level enlisting large and medium industries to be partners along with defense PSUs as its members. And incidentally, uh, Dr. Kalam had said this just in a few days before he left this world at an event organized by none other than Asocha, which is organizing this event today. Uh, <clears throat> but then what exactly he meant by a MIC? A MIC for Dr. Kalam was not collaboration simply between Indian PSUs and Indian corporate houses. Again, I'm quoting him. Encouraging high technology tie-ups and joint ventures between India and other global, global defense industries will achieve not only competitiveness, but also envisage the product for export, he had underlined. In my considered view, the former president was bang on. MICs these days are getting increasingly globalized. Take, for instance, the case of the United States, the world's the foremost military power. Incidentally, the term military industry complex or military industrial complex was coined in the United States by President Eisenhower during the Cold War. During, actually he had not said it because the American military industry has so far developed through three stages. And before the Cold War, the first stage was there, which lasted in fact, before the, sorry, the Second World War, the first stage lasted from 1787 to 1941. And it consisted totally of the government-owned arsenals and CPATs. However, with the United States participating in the Second World War, President Roosevelt established the War Production Board by constricting the major private industries, particularly those in the automobile sector, into the wartime service. But after the war ended, not only these private companies such as Boeing and General Motors stayed on and consolidated their involved in the military sector, but they are also joined by others like AT&T, General Electric and IBM. One of the important features of the second era was that Pentagon financed the private sector, which in turn created world-class technologies that were for use not only by the military, but also for the ordinary citizens. One can cite in this regard examples of drone, night vision Googles, GPS in cars, and what is most important, the internet. But when the Cold War came, and that is the third stage, which is undergoing at the very moment, what precisely happened was that some, develop, some you know, changes you know, took place. First, the industry shifted from diversified conglomerates and was managed by defense-only firms. Secondly, the contribution of the Pentagon, both financially and technologically, has been declining thanks to the shrinking defense budgets. As a result, and this is the third feature, the American MICs are increasingly buying commercial technologies, either buying or giving these technology provided shares, such as cloud computing, cybersecurity, nanotechnology, and so on. Just see how the Googles has acquired Boston Dynamics that has created Big Dog, a four-legged robot that can support. So my point is this, what no, they are now saying that even this third phase is not adequate enough. And for this, they now have to go outside because the Pentagon, which as I said was, you know, the government was encouraging the private sector and was financing them is not in a position to do so. So that is why the 
latest you know, debate there, and I am giving this American example precisely because of this, that also applies to other big military industries elsewhere. What they said, and I'm quoting here William J. Lynn III, the former US Deputy Secretary, and he says, keeping in mind that the futures are inextricably intervened, the United States has to look beyond its borders to turn this fourth era to its advantage. And I think that is the key. Now that last week, India and US became major defense you know, partner countries, there are you know, scopes for these joint collaborations. And our speakers in the last session did talk about the fact that you know, export, they only will not be producing defense items for the domestic or the consumption by the end users here in India, but also will be a major you know, exporter. And here the point is, and everybody has not talked about you know, exports and the problems therein. The only point, I just know one minute, sir. The only point that I'd like to make is that, as what is the main case now? That 90, take the case of you know, DRDO. DRDO only manufactures you know, items for the Indian military. But there are certain times, many of the items that it has you know, developed are not accepted by our armed sources. The point is, no problem, if they are not up to the benchmark required by our own military forces, why can't they actually send these you know, products you know, outside? Maybe the requirement of the, the quality requirements of our armed forces is different from the quality requirements of the armed forces in the neighboring areas, say Southeast Asia, say West Asia. Why can't they, like you know, Pinaka missile, the army rejected it, but there is you no know, market for Pinaka missiles there in West Asia. My point is that you know, why the DRDO should not be given you know, more liberty and autonomy to create arms weapons for third countries. That's all. Thank you.